Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Our esteemed viewers, on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Sultan Mohammed Naimi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, I would like to welcome Ambassador Douglas Suleiman, President of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, USA, who will deliver this online lecture titled can the new Prime Minister of Iraq solve the country's enduring problems? During his 35-year diplomatic career, Ambassador Suleiman served as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2016 to 2019. Now I'm delighted to invite Ambassador Douglas Suleiman to deliver his lecture, The Floor is Yours. Thank you very much, and it is a pleasure to be with you today, if virtually only, at the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research. And I want to thank uh, Amal Al Ahmadi for moderating this uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you today. Thank you. I'm going to speak today about the challenges that confront the new Iraqi government and what new Prime Minister Mustafa Al Qadami might be able to do to overcome them and the kind of help he will need from countries outside of his own. Now, I will note at the start of my talk that this, this is not going to be a traditional academic lecture based on decades of study, the study of original source material in ancient library documents in Baghdad and Mustansadiyah universities. Rather, this will be a discussion of the ideas and the experiences of a practitioner, uh, a diplomat with more than three decades in the Middle East, and five of the last 10 years inside Iraq. So I'm gonna approach my talk the following way. First, I wanna talk about the basics of Iraq, population, demographics, economy. Then I will briefly introduce the new Iraqi government. Then I will lay out the serious challenges that Prime Minister Qadami and his government have inherited. And finally, I wanna lay out the reasons that Iraq needs to turn out well for the region and the world and ways that the United Arab Emirates, the United States and other friends of Iraq uh, can support the prime minister. So to start the basics, uh, I'm going to present information about geography, economy, demographics, uh, not to try to bore you all at the beginning of my lecture but to paint a picture of all of the complexity of Iraq. Iraq is unlike any other place I've ever traveled uh, for both good and bad reasons. So let me start at the beginning. Iraq has 440,000 square kilometers. That's more than five times the size of the UAE. It's not a particularly large country, nor does it a particularly small country. It fits in that middle range. Iraq should be a rich country. It has some of the world's largest oil reserves. It has water and irrigated agricultural land and a pretty good system to manage both. And Iraqis themselves respect education and hard work. And there are an awful lot of Iraqis. There are nearly 40 million now, about four times the total population of the United Arab Emirates, but nearly 40 times the population of UAE citizens. Uh, Iraq in 2017 had a gross domestic product of $649 billion, which was slightly less than the UAE's GDP in that same year at $696 billion. But with the big difference in population, the per capita GDP in Iraq is only $17,000, putting Iraq solidly on the list of middle income countries. In the UAE, it is $69,000, putting the UAE on par with or above most of the OECD industrialized countries. And what I want you to understand here is the difference in expectations of Iraqis and the ability of the Iraqi government uh, to do things as opposed to what Emirati citizens expect. Uh, Emirati personal expectations and what they think that their government can afford to do even in a time of lower oil prices and limited OPEC plus quotas is significantly different than what Iraqis think. Uh, 
And it's important to realize when we outside of Iraq are trying to place demands on an Iraqi government that we take into account the financial ability and what, uh, what Iraqis believe is proper and what the Iraqi government actually thinks that it can accomplish. Now, uh, Iraq has a very diverse population, um, but it has not had a professionally conducted census in decades. That said, uh, scientific projection shows us that Iraq is probably about 80% Arab, with a large Kurdish minority between 15 and 18%, and a lot of smaller ethnic groups. Turkmen, Yazidi, Shabak, Hakai, Assyrian, Circassian, Persian, and many others making up the difference. In terms of religion, Iraq is a majority Shia Muslim country with 65% of Iraqis uh, professing a Shia Muslim faith. There is a large Sunni minority, more than 30%, which includes most Kurds as well as Sunni Arabs. Yazidis, Christians, Sabian Mandians, and other smaller religious groups make up the difference. And maybe the most important demographic fact about Iraq is that Iraqis are very young. 58% of Iraqis are under the age of 25, and the median age of an Iraqi is only 21 years old. To compare, the median age of an Emirati citizen is 38 years old, meaning that your average Emirati has more education, more life experience, more maturity, probably is married and has children, and therefore has a different view of life and how, what their role is in society. And this difference has shown uh, a great impact on Iraq. The youth bulge and the relative lack of economic opportunity in Iraq has created a huge source of potential instability and of change for Iraq, but also for the region. Now, the Iraqi population is large. It's also complex, and there are many, many fissures and breaks with inside Iraqi society. The one that most people immediately think of when they think of Iraq is the religious divide between Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims. And this is significant because many political groups formed since 2003 have formed around religious principles or identities, and many jobs are distributed based on what Iraqis call uh, mahasasa, a uh, quota system. Uh, but this is not the end of the story. There are many other social fissures as well. These include residents of urban areas as opposed to residents of rural areas. Citizens who respect and abide by legislated law as opposed to those who uh, abide by an older tribal code. Differences in ethnic ambitions for Kurds, Yazidis, Christians, Sunni Arabs. And one that is most important is the level of education where many Iraqis are very well educated, but a large number of them are not well educated. Some of these fissures in society reinforce each other, like the rural urban divide and those who follow legislated law versus tribal code, they tend to reinforce each other. But some cut across each other, like um, identity with uh, a religious group being either Sunni or Shia, and the level of education, where educated Sunnis and Shi are more likely to agree with their educated cohort and not necessarily their religious cohort. My point here is to tell you that Iraq and Iraqi politics is a lot more complicated than just what you read about in the press, that everything comes down to differences between Sunnis and Shia in Iraq. Now that I've told you a little bit about the backdrop of Iraq, um, let me talk a little bit about the new government. Uh, Prime Minister Mustafa al-Khadmi has inherited all of these divisions uh, and all of these facts that I just talked about when he became prime minister last month. Khadami himself is a very interesting political personality. He comes from a respected Shia religious family and is related to the leadership of the Khadamiya shrine in Baghdad. 
He therefore has better than usual connections to senior and more moderate Shia religious leaders in Najaf, Karbala, and Baghdad. He has worked as a journalist and a writer and a political activist and worked for a long time at the Iraq Memory Foundation where he was in charge of collecting the oral histories of the victims of violence and torture of Saddam Hussein's regime. And very interestingly, in 2014, former Prime Minister Hyder al uh, appointed Qadami as the chief of the Mukhabarat, the Iraqi National Intelligence Service, and he served in that position until he became Prime Minister. As intelligence chief, Prime Minister Abadi often sent Qadami to countries in the region to deliver quiet messages and to have uh, quiet discussions. He built some very good relationships, including in Riyadh, Kuwait, and Ankara, and I hope as well in Abu Dhabi. Qadami as Prime Minister has been able to complete his cabinet of 22 ministers more quickly than any other post-2003 Iraqi government. But that does not mean that he has broad political support within the Iraqi parliament. Qadami is not from any political party, and he was the lowest common denominator choice after two other candidates failed to get a parliamentary majority, Muhammad Alawi and Adnan Azurthi. Uh, Qadami has chosen a, a pretty good, mostly technocratic cabinet, but in Iraq, this may be enough. Um, let me explain what I mean. In the United States, presidents usually select their cabinet secretaries from among politicians from their political party. And then the professional technocratic bureaucracy implements and moderates and shapes the instructions that come from their political bosses. Uh, Iraq's governments are completely upside down. Even though many ministers are technocrats, they lead ministries that are packed with political cronies and the cousins of important people. And these bureaucrats often refuse to implement the decisions of the prime minister and the council of ministers. And we'll discuss more about this later, why this becomes a problem for Iraq. Khadami has tried to move quickly on a number of issues of importance. And it gives us some indication of the priorities that he is pursuing. First, he has put very good people in charge of the ministries of defense and interior and has changed out the entire military general staff leadership. He sent his finance minister to Riyadh and Kuwait immediately after taking office and wanted to send him to Abu Dhabi as well, but apparently the scheduling did not work. Khadami has reached out to the United States and Western countries that have supported Iraq as well. And he has made it clear through both statements and some actions that he is the commander in chief of armed forces in Iraq and must be in charge of all of the armed units of the country. A very clear challenge to the independence of the uh, Hashid al-Shabi and other Shia militias supported by Iran. Now for the first few weeks, this is all pretty good. But what I want to tell you about next is the problems that Qadami must face. Uh, Qadami and his government have some very important issues to deal with. And I'm going to talk about four major issues and then one additional issue that's a little bit uh, off the topic. But he has an ineffective bureaucracy. He has to deal with the youth bulge. He has a great need for economic reform and development. He needs to defend Iraq's sovereignty. And then I want to talk a little bit about the semi-autonomous Kurdistan region of Iraq and their relationship with the new government. So let's take that first issue, uh, the Iraqi bureaucracy. Uh, when I am trying to be charitable and nice, I describe the Iraqi bureaucracy as ineffective, out of control, corrupt, and politicized. When I'm in a bad mood, I use much worse words than that. Uh, the Iraqi quota system that I talked about a little bit above, the Mohassasa system, has wreaked havoc on the Iraqi government. Since 2003, many responsible positions in the Iraqi government were given to party loyalists or supporters of militias. And 
in an effort to provide more jobs and get more political support, successive governments have stuffed the bureaucracy with unnecessary employees. An office that needs five employees to do the work might have 20 or 25 of those. As I said, many of them are simply cousins or relatives of important people in the government or in politics. To make things worse, in order to balance party and tribal interests in the bureaucracy, many decisions in the Iraqi bureaucracy must be taken by a committee and nearly all of those decisions require unanimity. So if you have a committee of nine bureaucrats to approve uh, the sale of land to business, it is possible for any one of those nine members to stop that sale from going forward, to stop the project. And to stop the project, uh, you don't actually have to say no if you're a bureaucrat. You can simply say nothing at all. And without nine unanimous votes on the committee, the project will not go forward. This has given bureaucrats enormous power to demand favors in exchange for their vote to approve projects and ideas before the government. And this has led to uh, significant amounts of corruption in the lower levels of the bureaucracy. And this corruption can be something as easy as telling uh, a businessman, if you give me $100, I will approve the project for you. That's fairly straightforward. But if a political party, if a militia or if a powerful tribe doesn't like a project because it uh, might reduce their income or hurt their political impact, it can simply tell one of its representatives in the bureaucracy to not take a position on a project and therefore let the project die a natural death. This is the main reason that successive Iraqi governments have been unable to provide basic services, implement new programs, or cooperate effectively with other countries or foreign companies. And I know that for the Arab Gulf states, there are many complaints that when they approach the Iraqi government, they get enthusiasm from high levels of the government, but then the projects and the ideas that they hope to begin with Iraq get stuck in the sand in implementation. This government bureaucracy has seriously stifled any economic growth outside of the oil and gas industry. And this lack of economic growth brings me to uh, the second really big issue that Khalidmi must face, and that is his huge youth bulge, the rise in youth population. The average Iraqi, as we discussed, is 21 years old. He knows nothing of Saddam Hussein, or the US invasion, let alone the Iran-Iraq war or the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. He only knows that his government cannot provide electricity, clean water, medical care, good education, or a job. And that is why hundreds of thousands of young Iraqis, mostly young uh, Shia from Baghdad in the South, went into the streets starting last October to demand fundamental changes to the way that Iraq is governed. Now, interestingly, they do not want to pull down the democratic electoral system that Iraq is based on. They believe that that gives them the right to go into the streets and protest. But they do want to see a reform of the political system and a real fight against bureaucratic inaction and bureaucratic corruption. They're also very concerned by the overreach of militias, many of which are sponsored or supported by Iran, and they feel that Iran, and at some stages the United States, have too much to do with the business of their country. Maybe the most interesting thing about the demonstrations that I have found is that these young Iraqis are also looking for a sense of an identity that the current fragmented, sectarian, inefficient Iraqi government or governments have not been able to provide. One of the most prominent slogans in the demonstrations has been Nuridu Watan, uh, saying that we want to identify with something larger than ourselves. We want to be a nation 
We want something positive in which we can believe and to which we can give our loyalty. But in order to address the demands of the demonstrators, uh, Prime Minister Kadami is going to have to address a third issue, the dire need for economic reform and development. As I said earlier, Iraq is a rich country and Iraqis should be rich. But why isn't it? A lot of the reason is because uh, hundreds of years of history, decades of Baathist education, centralized government, and socialist economic policies have convinced Iraqis in government that it is the role of government to control the economy and allocate the resources the way that they should be according to the principles uh, of socialist economics. And what makes it more difficult to reform is that most Iraqis agree with this idea. Most Iraqis believe that it is the responsibility of the government to take oil and gas out of the ground, sell it, and distribute that wealth fairly to the citizens as services, education, and jobs. Now, this concept worked pretty well when Iraq's oil revenue was large enough to support a much smaller Iraqi population. But the population has doubled in the past 20 years, and in the past 20 years, public sector employment has tripled. Iraq has no more room in government offices for new college graduates and no money to pay more salaries. And let me give you an example of how serious this problem is. In 2018, about 850,000 Iraqis graduated from secondary school or university and entered the job market. The government was able to provide them that year with only about 50,000 new government jobs and the salaries of those jobs nearly broke the government's budget. And within a couple of years, probably by 2023, a million new young Iraqis will enter the labor market every year, and it will be impossible for the government to continue with the old model of providing government employment to every Iraqi who needs a job. So without economic reform, without expansion of the private sector, and without true deregulation of the economy and taking the power out of the hands of bureaucrats uh, it is going to be impossible for Iraq to provide jobs and responsibilities and livelihoods for the new generation of Iraqis. So the youth who have few services, no job prospects, end up in the streets protesting. A fourth issue that Prime Minister Al-Khadami is going to have to deal with um, is the issue of Iraqi sovereignty and what he must do to defend that sovereignty. One of the biggest issues that Prime Minister Al-Khadami faces is that uh, he must deal with the divisions within his own security forces. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Counterterrorism Service, the Muhammadat and parts of the federal police are loyal to the elected prime minister. Uh, they are supported by the United States um, and its Western allies and are seen in the population as being supported by the United States and Western allies. However, large parts of the official security forces that are now also government funded, the popular mobilization forces, Qawat al-Hashid al-Shabi, do not recognize Qadami as their commander in chief. Some are motivated by Shia Iraqi nationalism and are looking for a sectarian vision for Iraq. Other groups are simply executing instructions from their patrons in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps and the Quds Force and are helping implement Iran's strategic objectives in Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon. Unfortunately, many Iraqis believe that the country is caught in a struggle for dominance between the United States and Iran, and the rhetoric from both Tehran and Washington often leaves that impression. But the reality is that Iraq will not develop in the way that it should if it cannot control the use of officially sanctioned police and military force inside the country, one aspect of sovereignty. In the long term, 
Prime Minister Khadibi also has to deal with the second issue of sovereignty, and that is to be able to force the bureaucracy to carry out the administrative and economic decisions uh, that it makes. A bureaucracy that refuses to implement the decisions of its government through corruption or influence by foreign powers or individual political parties also weakens the sovereignty of Iraq. And the third issue of sovereignty, which may be the most difficult to uh, tackle, is the question of Iraq's borders. Iraq's borders are moderately well enforced with Kuwait and with Jordan, to some extent uh, with Turkey, but the border between Iran and Iraq uh, is essentially a one-way membrane where things can come in easily from Iran, but almost nothing goes from Iraq into Iran. This is another issue of sovereignty that probably will take many years uh, for Qadhi or any other government to address. In addition to those four substantive issues, there's another big issue that always hovers just below the surface in Iraq and that uh, Prime Minister Qadhi is going to have to deal with, and that is the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The Kurdistan region is a semi-autonomous area that was created as part of the Iraqi constitution to, to convince Kurds to join Iraq voluntarily. Now, the Kurdistan region suffers from most of the same problems that the rest of Iraq does. Corruption, an inefficient bureaucracy, a youth bulge, and a need for significant bureaucratic and economic reform. Although it is the regional government in Erbil and the political power centers in Erbil and Suleimaniyah that call the shots, not Baghdad. The two dominant political parties in the Kurdistan region, the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Masoud Barzani and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan of the late President Jalal Talabani have dominated political life in the region and tried to crush political opposition as they control the economic activity in their areas. Their parties and their party Peshmerga units have in some years going back decades clashed and even asked for Baghdad's assistance to defeat the other party. And in other years, as right now, they work together relatively well. The point I'm making here is that uh, the Kurdish political elites in Iraq are not united, except maybe in one idea. The hope for Kurdish independence continues to be a strong emotional and political demand for many Kurds. But the Iraqi Kurdish leadership has not yet found the right political formula to convince politicians in Baghdad and to convince other Iraqi Kurdish politicians that they have the right plan and can leave Iraq uh, rationally and create a stable, independent Kurdistan. And far from convincing each other or Baghdad, they haven't even begun to try to convince Ankara and Tehran that they should become independent and there will be significant opposition for any move from these two regional capitals as well. Now, Prime Minister uh, Kazemi has a pretty good history with the Kurds, uh, a lot of friendships, and he has appointed a very senior Kurdish official, Fuad Hussein, as his new foreign minister. But he's going to have to tread very carefully and balance the interests of his friends in Kurdistan with his need to get support from political parties in other parts of the country, particularly the more powerful Shia political parties of the south of Iraq. So he will not be able to do all of what the Shia political parties in the south would like to do with regard to the Kurds, nor will he be able to let the Kurds do everything that they want as well. He will have to balance these competing uh, requests for resources and political power. Now that I've laid out the really difficult problems that Prime Minister Academy has inherited, let me run through some of the reasons why I think the United States, the United Arab Emirates, other countries in the region and the world should continue to assist Iraq and Prime Minister Academy. First, and in the fairly near term, 
strong and professional Iraqi security forces are really necessary to keep ISIS from reemerging as a threat to Iraq and the region. Uh, ISIS is trying very hard to reorganize uh, in the areas between the Iraqi army and the Kurdistan Peshmerga, and with the restrictions of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, they have been able to make some inroads that they have not had in the past several years. Second, a truly independent Iraq can deter Iran and Iran's use of proxy forces to conduct their strategic objectives in the region. But I believe that it is only Iraqi patriotism and nationalism and strong Iraqi security forces loyal to the elected government that can actually deter this Iranian overreach and attempt to use Iraqi proxies to do their bidding. Third, it's very important that the international community and the Iraqi government provide assistance and politically empower minority communities in Iraq, uh, particularly the Kurds, the Yazidis, and the Christians, but also the smaller communities. By doing so, it is possible to strengthen Iraq's diversity, which is one of Iraq's strengths, uh, but it will also help these communities recover from ISIS. It is also necessary for the world to put pressure on Baghdad to provide proper political representation of and services to Iraq's underserved Sunni population. Doing so in the west and the north of the country can help prevent the emergence of another violent extremist group like Al Qaeda or ISIS and bring Sunni Arab Iraqis into the fold and make them feel more like Iraqis. On the economic front, a strong private sector based Iraqi economy can provide significant markets for products from the region and from around the globe and can help push out forced Iranian trade in goods. And investment in certain sectors, oil, gas, electricity, renewables, banking, infrastructure, healthcare, and tourism can be both profitable and ways to help stabilize the Iraqi economy and build Iraqi economic independence. It's also very important to expand Iraq's political and economic integration in the region. And I particularly look to closer ties between Iraq and Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the Emirates, and Jordan as the best sources of political and economic stability and also as strong counterweights to Iranian influence in the country. I also think that real economic reform and a true opening of the Iraqi economy to Iraqi entrepreneurs is the only way to provide opportunities for the fast growing youth population to support itself. Without these economic opportunities, Iraq's youth budge will continue to go into the streets, will continue to protest, and continue to be a source of instability as opposed to a source for growth. Now, I will stop there um, and say that this half an hour discussion was necessarily very general, and I have not even touched on all the issues that confront the country or that confront Prime Minister uh, Khazimi. But like the Prime Minister, uh, I have prioritized what I wanted to cover and talked about the things that I think are most important and will have the greatest relevance as we move forward, uh, trying to help Iraq again become independent and prosperous. So I look forward to questions from our, mod from our moderator, uh, Ms. Amal Al Ahmadi, and I'm uh, Happy to take your questions now. Thank you, Ambassador Solomon, for such an informative lecture. We would also like to elaborate some more on a few additional points. First, an article written five years ago for the U.S. newspaper, The Monitor. al Kazimi said, Iraqi-Saudi relations are the key to answering the problems and providing solutions to crisis in the Middle East. Do you think Mustafa al Kazimi still believes in this? 
Is he heading toward rebuilding relations with the Arabian Gulf states based on common interests and mutual benefit? Thank you very much. I think that's an excellent question. Um, I know Mustafa Qadimi fairly well from my time as ambassador in Baghdad when he was the head of the uh, Mukhabarat. And as I said, one of the roles that he played when he was the chief of the Mukhabarat was to travel to many of the countries in the region uh, to try to build relationships and carry quiet messages about uh, how Iraq could cooperate with Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the Emirates, Turkey, um, Jordan, and some countries more uh, farther from, from Iraq. So I think his personal inclination is to build stronger relationships, particularly with the Arab states of the Gulf. Um, and I include Jordan to some extent in this as well. So if you're sitting in, in Abu Dhabi looking at how Iraq policy is going to evolve with regard to the Gulf. Uh, I think there are different ways to look at it um, and you need to help balance, you need to help uh, Kazemi balance his priorities for dealing with the Gulf. Uh, it is quite certain that because of economic pressures, the drop in the price of oil, the reduction in uh, the OPEC quotas for Iraq by nearly a million barrels a day, the Iraqi government is now suffering or faced with a very serious budget crisis. Uh, and I know that uh, Finance Minister Ali Alawi, when he went to Riyadh and Kuwait and when he had hoped to come to Abu Dhabi, was going to ask for some assistance from those countries uh, on the fiscal side to help the Iraqi government continue its budget. But it's not the only thing that he is asking for. What Khadami really wants is to expand the broad ties of Iraq with its Arab neighbors, and to a large extent to emphasize the, the Arab identity of Iraq and the brotherhood with countries in the region. So yes, Iraq may want money, and I know that there's a long history a long difficult history uh, in the Gulf of giving money to Baghdad going back decades uh, that have not really solved the problems. What is important for the Gulf states, and I think Saudi Arabia is probably the key to this, um, is that the assistance come with some sort of conditions, if there is assistance that is able to be offered. But what is probably more important for Iraq and for building longer term relationships is creating economic relationships that are not government to government, but company to company. Uh, as I mentioned in my lecture, uh, the border between Iran and Iraq is a one-way membrane. A lot of things come in from Iraq, from Iran into Iraq, and Iran dumps a lot of low quality goods into Iraq to try to get money to, uh, to subsidize and run the Iranian government. Uh, it is very important that products produced in Jordan, in Kuwait, and in Saudi Arabia, and potentially in the Emirates as well, also make their way into the Iraqi economy to compete with those Iranian goods. Um, I will say up in Kurdistan in the northern part of Iraq, um, it's fairly easy to find good quality yogurt. But in the south of Iraq, it isn't, because there's a lot of bad quality yogurt that comes in from Iran, and I've had some very good yogurt in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait produced locally. This is the kind of product that could go into the Iraqi market. Uh, the prices are very low, average Iraqis can, can afford it. And it builds relationships. It also helps strengthen um, Iraq's identity as an Arab country um, and helps push some of the products that Iran is dumping into the Iraqi market uh, out of that market. So. Uh, while Iraq is going to want some financial assistance from the Gulf, I think what Iraq really needs is greater economic partnership um, and a greater sense that the Gulf states care about Iraq moving forward in a positive direction. And what I have suggested to American officials, and I think I will uh, make the same suggestion to Gulf officials as well, is that 
more senior Gulf officials should travel to Baghdad. They should invite more Iraqi ministers and senior bureaucrats to Kuwait and Riyadh and Abu Dhabi uh, and uh, Manama to explain to them how things are done. And in particular for the Emirates, this is one area where I think the Emirates has a real advantage. Uh, many, many Iraqi friends of mine have traveled to Dubai and to Abu Dhabi, and they've come back to Baghdad and said, good Lord, I had no idea that Arabs could build cities that look like that. Why can't we do that in Iraq? We have oil, we have smart people, we have engineers, and the inspiration of seeing the skyline of Dubai, the inspiration of seeing what the government in Abu Dhabi has been able to accomplish may give enough Iraqis ideas that they too can break free and aspire to the same kind of economic development, the same kind of prosperity that they see elsewhere in the Gulf. It's harder for Iraq because the population is bigger, um, but what it really needs is bureaucratic reform, some economic reform, and really a vision of what Iraq can do. And I think, as I said, particularly the Emirates can inspire that kind of a vision through what uh, you have been able to do in many different Emirates uh, in your country. Thank you, Ambassador. Another question is, Mustafa Al-Kazimi spoke of Iraq's independence in taking decision and distancing itself from the tension between Washington and Tehran. How can this be achieved while the two countries continue to use Iraq as a field to settle scores between themselves? This is a really crucial issue right now um, for, for Qadhimi. And the problem is one that is, uh, has been created to some extent by both Washington and by Tehran. Um, it is clear through President Trump's maximum pressure campaign that the United States is trying to essentially destroy the government in Tehran and make, uh, and make it impossible for Tehran to implement many of the bad policies, the interference that it is conducting in the region, particularly in Iraq and in Syria, but also in the Gulf. Um, on the other side, Tehran has offered their maximum resistance campaign, expanded support to proxy forces in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, in an attempt to defend itself from the sanctions of the United States and to great, get greater economic benefit, particularly from Iraq, which still has a large economy. Um, so Khadami is faced with a position where he is a neighbor of Iran. He's got a 1,400 kilometer border with Iran, and Iran is going to be there forever. Throughout history, Mesopotamia and Persia have lived next to each other. Khadami also believes that Iraq needs the assistance of the United States and the West to properly develop its security forces and its economy, because these are things that Iran really cannot offer to, to Iraq. So what Khadami has to do is balance um, his priorities and find a way to work simultaneously both with the United States and with Iran. That will require a certain amount of reasonableness on behalf of both Washington and Tehran. And I think from my experience in the government in Washington, there is a recognition that there is no way to separate Iranian influence in some degree from Iraq. It's always going to be there because of the, the ties of religion, the ties of tribes, the ties of families, and the close proximity. But uh, it is important to make sure that that Iranian influence does not hurt Iraqi sovereignty, does not prevent the development of the Iraqi economy, and does not involve Iraqis, Iraqi militias, in wars in Syria or Lebanon that have nothing at all to do with the foreign policy of the Iraqi government. So uh, this is a very, very difficult thing that Khadami is going to have to do, but it's essentially in the short term to balance between very strong Iranian influence through the Hashid al-Shabi and some Shia political parties with very strong American influence in the economy and through uh, the traditional defense forces. And for the short term, 
I don't think that he's going to be able to choose either the United States or Tehran. He's going to have to balance between the two of them and uh, so that each of them can declare at least a few small victories. Because Khadami's goal has got to be building an Iraqi government, building an idea in the minds of Iraqis of a strong Iraq that can control its own destiny without interference from Tehran, without a lot of help from the United States or the West. So uh, I can't really answer the question other than to say, I think in, pragmatically, he's going to have to balance the interest of the two, but focus on what he needs to do for Iraq while doing so. Thank you. Finally, is now the right time to withdraw U.S. forces from Iraq, even though reports say ISIS will possibly return, especially in light of the increasing attacks recently? I, the simple answer is I don't think now is the time to withdraw U.S. forces from Iraq, uh, but it's also important to understand what those American and coalition forces actually are and what they have been doing, because there is... Uh, uh, propaganda that is put forward by Iran and some of the uh, the more radical of the Hashid al-Shabi units and some of the pro-Iran political parties uh, try to get Iraqis to believe that American combat troops are running around the country conducting military operations completely on their own, uh, which is completely untrue and hasn't happened since 2011. Uh, the role of U.S. forces and of coalition forces in Iraq has really been twofold. Uh, U.S. and coalition forces came back into the country, into Iraq in 2014, at the request of the Iraqi government to help the Iraqi government defeat uh, Daesh after it crossed the border from Syria. Uh, as part of that, the Iraqi government has also asked the coalition in the United States to help train and develop the Iraqi security forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Counterterrorism Service, uh, Mohabarat, um, and parts of the police and the border police uh, to better professionalize them, better organize them, and make them more effective so that they can deal with future threats like Daesh or Al-Qaeda without needing foreign interference interference and intervention. So since early 2018, uh, the United States has conducted very, very few military operations inside Iraq. Every single one of them has been coordinated with the Iraqi military, and they are usually airplane or drone strikes against specific targets. The important role that U.S. forces have played is to help organize, train, and mentor Iraqi security forces in the command centers to help them come up with operational plans to go against a Daesh position, to help them reorganize the placement of their forces, to help them restructure their training so their soldiers are more professional. So uh, going back to the original question, I think that these roles are still very important for uh, American, British, French, German, Italian, uh, Spanish, Dutch, Danish. There's a bunch of uh, 17 different countries who have uh, some military forces in Iraq, but they're not on the ground fighting. They're helping the Iraqi army develop. And this kind of role can be done with a very small number of U.S. forces. And if you look at the, uh, the outcome of the first round of the strategic dialogue conduct the United States and Iraq, the joint communique, which was uh, coordinated very carefully between the two sides, of course, talked about a continued removal of American forces from the country. Uh, there's no problem with removing forces from Iraq, uh, from Italy, from Canada, from Spain, from the United States that no longer have a mission that the Iraqi government supports. But when it gets down to the smaller number of forces, uh, I think it is still important for the Iraqi government to have some help and some support from American soldiers and other Western coalition soldiers for the purposes that I, that I talked about. Again, the other side of that equation, however, is that Iran has determined that it wants all American forces out of the region. 
and they have since they have good proxy forces inside Iraq, they've decided to start with Iraq and try to eliminate all foreign forces other than their forces from Iraq. So there's going to be significant pressure from Tehran and significant pressure from some parts of the Hashid al-Shabi and some political parties in Iraq to remove American forces from, uh, uh, all foreign forces as they will say it, from Iraq. And on the, uh, the 5th or 6th of January, the Iraqi parliament passed a resolution uh, that was boycotted by almost all of the Sunni members and almost all of the Kurdish members of the parliament to remove for, to ask the government to remove foreign forces. Uh, what is interesting is that in the discussions in the strategic dialogue, the Iraqis didn't ask the United States to remove all of its forces. What they asked for was to carefully define in coordination with the Iraqi government and the Iraqi higher command, the roles and missions that those forces would play, training, mentoring, planning. Uh, so what I expect is that there will be continued Iranian propaganda trying to push US forces out. There will probably be continued attacks on the American embassy, potentially the British embassy, and on Iraqi bases where uh, coalition forces are located. But I think that there is a very good reason for those forces to be in the country. And I think that Prime Minister Khadimi understands why having a small number of those foreign forces helping his army makes a lot of sense for Iraq. Thank you, Ambassador. At the end of this lecture, we would like to once again thank Ambassador Douglas Silliman for his lecture, as well as you, our viewers. We look forward to welcoming you to our future events. Thank you.